Of the many thousands of culture-shaking inventions of the 20th century, few have shaped entertainment as we know it as the dawning of the video game console. Released in 1972, the Magnavox Odyssey, with the kind of name that gave gaming a nerdy reputation for decades, is often heralded as the very first video game console, allowing players to swap around game cards to change up the gameplay from table tennis to submarine. Whoa, slow down there, Nelly Furtado! The Atari 2600 and Intellivision weren't too far behind, with fanboys for each reportedly faxing each other the skull emoji as the first console war began. Compare those graphics to today's games and it's clear just how far we've come in the intervening years of this still remarkably pretty young industry. It's not always been smooth sailing for playing games from the comfort of your own living room in the West, however. Arcades were simply better places to play your games for many years before an absolute tidal wave of junk flooded the console market in the early 1980s and threatened to bring it all to its knees. Noticing an opportunity in the market, Nintendo stepped in to try their hand at the home console market, effectively creating a blueprint for everyone else to follow. Sega and other rivals weren't too far behind. It wouldn't be much longer until playing habits started to shift from the arcade to the home in the 90s, and then a certain Sony came along to give gaming its cooler edge by putting a marsupial in jorts. When I try and do that to my cat, the RSPCA won't stop calling me. While Sega would sadly depart the console scene shortly after the new millennium, it left room for PC giants Microsoft to dip their toes into the crowded pool, spawning the Xbox brand. Across the 2000s, 2010s and now 2020s, there's been no shortage of options for players across the world, the kind of healthy competition that somehow results in slurs getting slung around on Twitter because a game on a console had one less frame per second than another. Ha! <laughs> losers, drink a big glass of oxygen that isn't your own farts, guys. With us now deep into the ninth generation of consoles, if you can believe that, and the future of the home console as we know it seemingly changing in ways few could predict with the rise of cloud gaming and gradual sad death of physical media, it's time to look back on the best video game consoles of all time across many years and far, far too many words. These are the 25 best video game consoles of all time. Before we get into this though, we do have a video for every single console mentioned here, and we think they're pretty dang good. Be sure to check them all out down in the description down below. Right, time to get some angry skull emojis in the facts. Many people's first thoughts, or collection of numbers when it comes to all things Atari, is likely to be 2600, as it's the console often cited with changing everything we know about gaming. However, the 7800 does everything the 2600 can, but better. Not only can the 7800 play the large majority of 2600 games in a feat of backwards compatibility that was an absolutely massive important deal back in 1987, it also has a raft of its own great games, including Joust and Pull Position 2. The Atari 7800 was also revolutionary for including a little something called quality control, meaning that the market would become less and less flooded with the aftermarket slop that almost drowned the 2600. The 7800 may not have been much of a competitor to the NES in the grand scheme of things, thanks to Jack Tramiel's refusal to release it for two whole years, just maybe, just maybe for a laugh, maybe? But for being arguably the last time when Atari was truly great, and for helping to tighten up the absolute wild west of 80s gaming, the 7800 has a far greater legacy than people give it credit for. Number 24, PlayStation Vita. Speaking of legacy, it's hard not to dream of what kind of legacy the PlayStation Vita could have left behind had Sony been just a little bit braver with it. While the Vita is a fantastic piece of hardware even in 2024, one that feels massively influential for the current state of handheld gaming, Sony were guilty of easing off the gas a little too soon with its first party games quickly drying up. The underwhelming sales, not helped by that expensive ass proprietary storage, probably didn't help them to commit more to the handheld. However, while the Vita didn't burn bright for long, it burned very bright indeed. First party titles like Gravity Rush, Tear Away, Uncharted Golden Abyss and Killzone Mercenary made people rethink what handhelds were capable of, while JRPG franchises like Persona positively flourished. It may not be the powerhouse it is now without its Vita stint. A wealth of indie games and visual novels also found a natural home on Sony's Little Marvel, and Sony's cross-buy initiative was a player-first move that the company seems to have pretty few of these days. 
The OLED screen can still look absolutely stunning today, and it really just strikes a perfect balance of weight and comfort that even Nintendo haven't quite managed with the Switch. Pick up a Vita today, and you might struggle to put it down. It often feels like being in a cult to be a Vita fan, but sign us up if it means we get to dive into televisions and also become a benevolent son. Number 23, the Master System. The Master System may have pretty soundly lost the NES when it came to their battle in the mid 80s, but for providing a strong jumping off point for Sega as a haul into the Western console space, it's hard to overlook its importance. The 8-bit system was actually technically stronger under the hood than Nintendo's culture shifting box, and it had some games to showcase just that. Fantasy Star became a phenomenon thanks to the Master System, Alex Kidd tortured poor children across the world, and Wonder Boy filled many homes with wonder after being ported from arcades, a tradition that Sega would lean on a lot with their consoles. The Master System also had a couple of miracle ports too, with Sonic the Hedgehog able to go moderately fast in the generation prior to his natural home on the Genesis. For offering a serious alternative to the NES, utilising the kind of unique D-pad that bespoke controller makers now charge wild money for, and surviving well into the 90s, the Master System is a system that deserves its flowers. There's a reason why it's still being played and manufactured in Brazil to this very day. And no, it's not because of great basketball. Wow, check out the ego on this guy, eh? Jeez. Number 22, the 3DS. Though the 3DS, the free on DS Kennedy to give it its full name, was competition for the Vita, it's difficult not to wish that Sony had learned some lessons from Nintendo on how to turn a failing handheld around. The 3DS released to a pretty cold reception, with a handheld struggling to shift units. Following some revisions, including one that eventually removed the polarising 3D effect and some heavy price cuts to boot, the 3DS went on to be yet another smash hit for Nintendo. The 3DS took everything that worked about the DS, the dual screen, neat party tricks, great first party support, and the ability to gaze at yourself in the cold blackness of two screens at once and wonder where it all went terribly, terribly wrong, and brought it more in line with modern expectations, while also adding a 3D slider that caused a whole bunch of nausea. It was, and still is, a pretty neat effective gimmick that worked remarkably well in terms of giving its games added visual depth, but the handheld 3D slider was only ever in one setting for most people. The 3DS was no slouch in terms of games either, offering excellent updates to franchises like Fire Emblem, The Legend of Zelda, and, of course, a little guy called Mario. No, not, not that one. Not that one, Joe. While New Horizons is Animal Crossing at its most culturally relevant, New Leaf is seen as the series' high point by many of its fans, and the raft of fantastic ports of classic Nintendo games offered a solid spine for the handheld's entire library to work from. The 3DS may not have managed to completely flourish in the battle against the rise of mobile gaming, but it did give Nintendo themselves a whole new dimension. Number 21, the Sega Saturn. If Sega had simply taken a breath to figure out their strategy better, or perhaps even if its release had been slightly more tactically timed, there's no telling where the Saturn might have landed on any list of the best video game consoles of all time. Beating the original PlayStation and Nintendo 64 to market, the Saturn offered players a first glimpse at what the future of gaming would look like in glorious 3D. It's often documented how much developers struggle to adapt to the 32 and 64-bit generation's many challenges, and a lot of that can be seen on the Saturn, though many of gaming's greatest ever games found a welcome home on the Saturn too. Burning Rangers, Panzer Dragoon Saga, and Knights into Dreams all belong in the video game pantheon, while the Saturn also boasts games that proudly flew the 2D flag like Magic Knight, Ray Earth, Guardian Heroes, and Dragon Force. <laughs> The Saturn has no shortage of fantastic games, if you have the pockets deep enough to pick them up physically, that is, but the lack of a proper Sonic game certainly hurt its appeal. The real downfall of the Saturn, though, the newcomer Sony and the old phone Nintendo, and a little bit of Sega themselves. The Saturn's surprise drop meant that suppliers were ill-equipped to push Sega's penultimate console, and once the Nintendo 64 release, what market share Sega had with the Saturn was quickly swallowed up. Sega had done a little too much in too short a space of time, and the Sega was perhaps guilty of shooting for the stars with a twitchy aim, as it really wouldn't be long at all before Sega moved on to their final ever console. Number 20, Xbox Series X and S. 
While the Xbox Series line may not have truly reached its potential just yet, it's already started to make up for the disappointment of the Xbox One, a console that you won't be finding on this list of the best games consoles of all time. With the Series X, which may well be Xbox's final ever disc-based console, Microsoft has provided power, versatility and accessibility in one sleek, fridge-like package. The memes were a plenty when the Series X was first revealed, but its simple design just works for those who might have been put off by the PS5's weird and futuristic chic. As for the Series S, it's a very solid, very discreet starting point in the current generation for those who only ever play titles through Game Pass with the price point to match. The Series S is a very capable device, but the lack of a disk drive and raw power that may become a millstone as the generation carries on could end up becoming a real hindrance for the Xbox brand. Quick Resume though is also quite possibly the best invention of the entire ninth generation as it means that players basically never have to quit their games anymore. It's not perfect, but being able to resume a game that you paused weeks ago while also playing other games is frankly wild. Though the future of the Series S may be up in the air, it seems like Xbox has finally started to deliver what its fans want, Vidigams. The Xbox ecosystem has no shortage of exclusives on the horizon and has arguably already delivered more than what the previous generation ever did. There's no telling where the duo could end up on a follow-up list in a few years' time. And I'm not saying we're susceptible to bribes, because that's illegal, but if you made a new grab by the ghoulies, oh, you know... Just saying, just saying, just putting it out there, just manifesting the ghoulies, you know, I, you know, man's got to manifest ghoulies sometimes. Number 19, the Nintendo Wii. The Wii was truly the shot in the arm that Nintendo needed and perhaps deserved after the struggles of the N64 and GameCube. While nowhere near as powerful as the Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3, the seventh generation saw Nintendo switching streams to focus more on gameplay over fidelity, a move that they've found great success in ever since. If we just ignore the Wii U, that is. We're not ignoring it. We're not ignoring it. It's the 20, it's 26th. It's just missed out. Oh, just missed out. Utilising motion controls that would soon be emulated by pretty much everyone else, the Wii was heavily marketed towards casual players who lapped up the ability to get fit and play more bowling than a certain Serbian Grand Theft Auto character. Though the Wii did certainly first and foremost focus on winning over everyone's parents, Nintendo also catered towards the hardcore with new entries in the Zelda series, a duo of Super Mario Galaxy games often revered as the best 3D Mario games ever, and a bunch of fantastic ports. Backwards compatibility with the GameCube also sweetened the deal considerably. Another chance to play Geist, Nintendo? You spoilers. Where the Wii really falls down is in how far apart those massive games were and also the overwhelming glut of shovelware that almost suffocated its release pipeline. The Wii is certainly a fantastic console that offered a welcome alternative to the grey and brown war zones often seen in the 7th gen, but unless you were very young or very unfit, it's a little harder to appreciate how much it changed the game. However, Nintendo had the balls to call a console a Wii, as in the stuff that comes out of you when you have too much Ribena, knowing full well it would be mocked in the playground worldwide. We're excited for the inevitable Switch follow-up, the Nintendo PP Poo Poo, to follow in this proud tradition. Number 18, the Nintendo DS. Just like in the console space, Nintendo also decided to innovate more in mechanics than in graphics when it came to their handhelds. While the PSP succeeded at basically bringing the PS2 into the palm of your hands, the DS went in a different direction. Utilising dual screens, hence the name, with touchscreen controls at a time when that was pretty revolutionary, the DS was Nintendo at their most playful and unique in a good few years. Many first-party games made smart use of both perspectives, with some allowing you to use the second screen as a map, inventory, and much more. And the first-party games were also a cavalcade of innovative, family-friendly experiences. Mario made a welcome return to 2D, Pokemon arguably had its best stretch since its very earliest days, and franchises like Fire Emblem and WarioWare had fantastically fun outings that utilised all of the DS's wackiest gimmicks. However, much like the Wii, what sinks the DS down the list slightly is just how much shovelware seemed to come out every other week. Everybody's brains were trained like Megaminds by the end of its run. 
Similarly, the third party experiences that weren't visual novels did seem to dry up at some point, with the DS arguably guilty of hanging around for too long and having perhaps one too many confusing revisions. Still, for offering many, many smaller series a chance to succeed, and for simply trying to be something a little silly at a time when everyone was being very serious, the DS managed to rack up 150 million units sold for a very good reason, and not just because of active health with Carol Vorderman. Number 17, the PlayStation 5. When it came time to develop their next console, it's easy to imagine that Sony simply looked at the PS4 and went, again, but better. The PlayStation 5 isn't a transformative leap from the previous generation, offering more convenience and iteration than the mind-blowing leap seen in previous generations, but it's already shaping up to be yet another massive winner. The SSD makes loading times almost a thing of the past, while 60fps is more common a thing than it has been since HD game development began. Though it is a pity that it's still always with some kind of caveat. Switch over to performance mode in some of the higher budget games and you will still get some truly gorgeous visuals that you'd have to pay a premium for if you wanted them on your PC. Then there's the controller, which really may well be the very best one Sony has ever made. Not only is it perhaps the perfect balance of weight and grip feel, but the DualSense's haptics and adaptive triggers only deepen the immersion across Sony's rich lineup of cinematic games. Speaking of, while the first party console exclusives have only just started firing properly due to how tightly the PS5 in general has been tied to the previous generation, we've still seen some PlayStation all-timers like Marvel's Spider-Man 2, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, and Demon's Souls hit the console. The next few years then will ultimately determine what kind of legacy the PlayStation 5 leaves behind, but if they keep at it like this, Sony may just have yet another 100 plus million seller console on their hands. Sony, you know what you must do. Let him in. Number 16, Game Boy and Game Boy Color. While we separated the two on our Nintendo console ranking video, we've decided to combine the Game Boy and Game Boy Color here to allow for a bit more variety. Whether together or on their own, these two handhelds change the face of gaming as we know it, with even Steam Decks nowadays no doubt still being called Game Boys by parents the world over. It's difficult to quantify just how important the Game Boy was when it first released in 1989. While clearly a lot more condensed, being able to play handheld versions of some NES and even arcade games felt like an act of magic. Tetris also wouldn't be the industry pillar it is now without the Game Boy, though you could also make the argument that vice versa is also true. And then there was the Game Boy Color, which may just be the most obvious upgrade in video game history. Offering players the chance to actually see the colours of whichever version of Pokemon they bought, the Game Boy Color gave the Game Boy line a shot in the arm for the next few years, with plenty of first party licences also flourishing on the handheld. Those pining for more classic Zelda were catered for with the sublime Oracle duology, while the likes of Donkey Kong, Wario and Kirby all got a chance to shine. While going back to unmodded versions of these handhelds is tough in current times, it's impossible to take away from the kind of wonder you would experience from a clutch of AA batteries and a good light source back in each Game Boy's pomp. Without them, who knows what handheld gaming would look like today. We might all be playing the game.com and perpetually veering further and further from God's light. Number 15, the Nintendo 64. Few consoles have a first party hit rate quite like the Nintendo 64. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Super Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, Perfect Dark, GoldenEye, Star Fox 64, <sighs> Paper Mario F-Zero X, all games that have a right to belong on any list of the best games of all time. Many of them manage to avoid the pitfalls of early 3D game development to offer an absolutely tantalising window into the future of gaming, the kind of generational leap that will never ever be seen again. Both Zelda games and Super Mario 64 in particular felt like travelling in a DeLorean for those who'd been playing the SNES for the last five years. The only real issue with placing the N64 much higher in this list is that, thanks to the console's pricey cartridge costs and the complexities of early 3D, we really didn't get enough of that quality spread across the whole of the N64's relatively small library. At less than 400 games released in total, the N64 never quite managed to crank out hit after hit like the original PlayStation could. 
Also, while the console boasted more RAM than the PS1, its GPU suffered from constant bottlenecking, meaning that performance issues were pretty, pretty common for third-party games. Going back to N64 games now is maybe even harder than it is going back to SNES games. However, if it's just iconic Nintendo games you're after, the Nintendo 64 is hard to beat. Chuck in four of those creatively designed controllers, there's an alternate timeline somewhere where the single stick Z button layout still lives on for some GoldenEye Mario Party or Smash with your friends, and you have perhaps the absolute peak of split screen gaming. Many friendships were forged for life in GoldenEye's Egyptian corridors, or swiftly broken when somebody picked Odd Job. Were you that guy? Publicly out yourself in the comments down below, you scoundrel! Number 14, the PlayStation 3. There are few late bloomers in the history of consoles quite like the PlayStation 3. While an impressive bit of tech that tried to do a little bit of everything when it was revealed, what didn't impress people was its price. The PS3 sold slowly, especially compared to the PS2 boom, and it would take a revision before it really started to hit its stride, and then never really let up from there. The PlayStation 3 boasts the genesis of The Last of Us and Uncharted series, two of the brand's pillars today, while suddenly now abandoned IPs like Infamous Resistance and Little Big Planet also sold in their millions. The PS3 even saw established names like Metal Gear Solid, God of War and Ratchet and Clank reach new highs, with Demon's Souls kickstarting the Soulsborne craze as we know it. Without the PlayStation 3, a lot more controllers would still be alive today. However, while the PS3 had some fantastic games, it might not have been the best place to play those games. Performance issues were pretty common and the massive wedge was a massive pain to program games for, with many games, particularly those from third party developers, running at frame rates that would be Twitter troll trough feed if they were to happen today. Despite that and the rather rough early period of its life, the PlayStation 3's open nature, if you catch our drift, matey. Free online play, rest in peace, PlayStation Home and raft of fantastic exclusives make it a flawed, ambitious gem. Also, release the banana cut, you cowards. Number 13, Xbox. The original Xbox hasn't yet received the retrospective glow that the likes of the GameCube or even the Saturn have, but if there's any console that's going to become the hipster's pick for the next decade, it's probably The Rock and Bill Gates' giant baby boy. While ultimately left behind in the PlayStation 2's dust in terms of sales, and that's putting it lightly, everything that was under the hood of the OG Xbox was quite a step up from Sony's portal into the third place, whatever that means. The internal hard drive removed the need for memory cards, while players could also rip their audio CDs directly to it to then use as soundtracks for the games. I just realised I said memory card instead of memory card. I'm going to leave that there, and I'm going to let you think about that for a bit. I'm going to let your mind create an image, and I don't want you to share that image with me. I just want you to sit on it for a bit, and just, just live with it. As for those games, most third-party releases looked and felt far better on the massive rectangle. Oh yeah, and the console also had a little series called Halo that would come to define the first-person shooter genre as we know it. The OG also boasted giant console exclusives like Knights of the Old Republic, Fable, Jade Empire, and Morrowind. Then there's just how experimental Microsoft were with what exactly they licensed for the platform. Even if you're a massive Xbox fan, you'll probably hear about a weird balmy game that you didn't even know existed every single week. Like, did you know that the console had a third Crazy Taxi game? I had no idea until about three weeks ago. While that initial controller was a rather oversized mishit, the original Xbox brought convenient online gaming into the home for millions of console players and birthed the start of a rivalry that's kept pushing the industry forward. It also has blinks. Little more needs to be said. Number 12, the Game Boy Advance. The Game Boy Advance, and more specifically its SP revision, did a lot to immortalise the whole Game Boy range thanks to one simple change the ability to clearly see what you're doing. The GBA's brighter screen and the fact that it plays previous Game Boy generations means that it's the best way to play those classics within the illustrious line. But the Game Boy Advance didn't spend all of its time looking back. While the rise of handheld 3D gaming wasn't too far away, the GBA managed to make the most of all of its 32 bits to provide arguably the hottest streak of 2D games in the palm of your hand, maybe ever. 
Not only did we see the customary catalogue of all-time classics from the likes of Mario, Zelda, Metroid and Pokemon, but we also saw some of Nintendo's less popular names get a chance in the spotlight. Fire Emblem, along with Path of Radiance on the GameCube, really started to cement the strength of the IP, while Advance Wars and Golden Sun managed to cultivate a very dedicated following. Chuck in the ability to recharge batteries with the SP, or only use two double A's with the base model, an absolute whipper of a Castlevania title, and the uh, ability to watch a forsaken, bit crushed episode of Spongebob, and you have Nintendo's best ever pure handheld. It didn't live for long, but other handhelds could only dream of what the Game Boy Advance achieved. If you had the tribal version of the Game Boy Advance SP, be sure to claim your cool points down in the comments down below. Number 11, the Sega Dreamcast. The Dreamcast's failure really just feels kind of... Well, it just feels kind of unfair. Not since the Genesis had Sega managed to make a console with such a hit rate when it came to games, but none of them were ever unfortunately going to be enough to dislodge the kind of market share that Sony and Nintendo had swallowed up by the late 90s. Everywhere you look, the Dreamcast it is a little something for everyone. The kind of variety and rapid fire release schedule that had arguably evaded the Saturn. It's worth just reeling off a list of the exclusives as a reminder of the kind of ballistics Sega brought to their final battle in the console war. Sorry about this, Joe. Crazy Taxi, Jet Set Radio, Shenmue, Space Channel 5, Sonic Adventure, House of the Dead, Virtua Fighter 3 TB, Power Stone, <sighs> Skies of Arcadia, Res, Soul Calibur, Ikaruga, Grandia 2, Resident Evil Code Veronica, Fantasy Star Online, all games and franchises that have hallowed status in the annals. And then there's the almost immediate influence the Dreamcast had on the industry at large. Online gaming would soon become commonplace on Xbox and less so on the PlayStation 2, but the Dreamcast beat them to it by a few good years, while also offering downloadable content in another first for consoles. Though ultimately a gimmick, that VMU also helped the Dreamcast to have one of the biggest personalities of any console too. We can only dream of the future that was robbed from us, in which everyone trades their chow points for rotisserie chickens on the Sega network, but it sure is nice to let your mind wander over what could have been. Number 10, the NES. Few consoles feel as important to the industry as we know it as the Nintendo Entertainment System, with the console basically acting as the sheriff for the wild west of the video game industry at the time. Granted, the NES still had its swerves of landfill fodder, but the console's stricter quality control and more uniform strategy was quite simply in another league compared to Atari. Though likely harder to appreciate today for younger players, the 8-bit NES did also feel several leaps above the rest of its competition graphically when it launched in the West back in 1985 after starting off as the Famicom in Japan. The NES was a reward for all of us surviving George Orwell's 1984. Bad year, that bad year. Pitched as more of an all-round system than something just for video games with parental hysteria around the hobby at an all-time high, the NES flew off shelves in toy stores and was a solid seller right up until 1995 when it was finally discontinued in America, Europe and Australia. The NES was also the foundation for some of the greatest video game franchises of all time. Mario and Zelda both got their proper starts on the console, with the pair now being multimedia giants that frequently cross into the mainstream. Without the NES, we probably wouldn't have Chris Pratt doing a vaguely Italian-American accent, and that frankly just doesn't bear thinking about. It wasn't just the plumber and frequently misgendered warrior who broke out on the NES though. Samus surprised everyone in her Metroid bow, Contra and Battletoads tested the strength of plastic everywhere, and Mega Man and Castlevania became established franchises. It really is impossible to imagine what the gaming industry would look like today had the Nintendo Entertainment System not released, and while the games themselves may have obviously aged, the NES itself will always remain immortal. Number 9, the Nintendo GameCube. The GameCube was Nintendo's last real attempt at going toe-to-toe -to -toe with their rivals in terms of power, and while the big pimp in Purple Pimp might have taken the bronze medal when going up against the PlayStation 2 and even Xbox, its game library could just about be the best range of exclusives Nintendo has ever put out. 
Much like the Dreamcast, the GameCube's array of fantastic games is worth reeling off to appreciate simply just how impressive its hit rate truly was. The Wind Waker, Metroid Prime, Pikmin, Resident Evil 4, Super Smash Bros. Melee, Eternal Darkness, Super Mario Sunshine, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, Luigi's Mansion, F-Zero GX, Mario Kart Double Dash and Animal Crossing all remain some of the absolute best games of the 2000s and hold up remarkably well too, arguably more so than most of the games on the console's two rivals at the time. The GameCube also featured innovative Game Boy Advance integration with the ability to play your Game Boy titles on the big screen feeling like black magic at the time for anyone who hadn't seen Nintendo repeat the trick earlier on the SNES. And while nobody, apart from apparently Paris Hilton, was carrying their GameCubes around as a fashion accessory, perhaps as Nintendo had hoped with that very sexy handle, the console remains arguably the most distinctly designed of its rivals. What sinks the GameCube on this list, as well as what sunk it at the time in the market, is that it lacked the modern trimmings that gamers would soon come to expect. Not only was online play a barely supported hassle, but the lack of a DVD player meant it really struggled to win over the casual crowd. The increasingly sparse release schedule also really didn't help matters. The GameCube deserves the kind of love today that you just almost wish it had seen back in the day for a good reason. If only Geist was truly appreciated in its time. Number 8. The Original PlayStation The OG PlayStation changed the game as we know it forever, showing everyone else exactly how to do 3D gaming on CD while also designing a controller that is basically the de facto blueprint for every other platform now. The original PlayStation felt like the new millennium had dawned early back in the mid 90s. Conceived after a deal with Nintendo fell apart when the House of Mario went behind Sony's back to negotiate with Philips instead, the PlayStation is proof that spite is one heck of a muse. The PS1 comfortably outsold the Nintendo 64 and effectively shut Sega out of the console war for good. It's easy to see how, too. The PlayStation converted non-gamers like few systems before it, with the built-in CD player effectively being a gateway into taking on planet-hating corporations and jumping on turtles. It also appealed to an older crowd than was typical in the market, with teenagers and young adults happy to embrace a pastime that was quickly becoming cool to enjoy thanks to the console's slightly edgier nature. But those players wouldn't have stuck around beyond the baffling adverts if the console didn't have the kind of games that would have become household names. Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Tomb Raider, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, Gran Turismo, Tekken and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater all broke out in massive ways on Sony's grey box, while Metal Gear and Final Fantasy both reached fantastic new heights. Really, the only thing holding the PlayStation back from climbing much higher on this list is the passage of time. Some crazy loading times and warped, wobbly textures aged the console more than games from generations prior, yet never forget just how mind-boggling this all was back in its explosive, revolutionary pomp. That is such a fun word to say, pomp. Pomp. Number 7. The PlayStation Portable the PSP being the highest placed handheld on this list and also being higher than the PS1 is no doubt going to raise some eyebrows. However, when you look at everything that this little marvel was capable of in the era in which it was released, it's absolutely wild to realise what exactly Sony cooked up back in the mid 2000s. Take everything you know about the modern smartphone, remove the annoying spam calls, and you basically have the PlayStation Portable. What Sony achieved was to shrink down the PS2 and place it into the palm of your grubby mitts, while also adding the ability to listen to music, watch movies, and even record footage and take photos. Add in online capabilities that were far smoother than what was on the handheld's bigger brother, and you have a handheld that was so much more advanced than the DS that it felt like Sony had fast-forwarded a generation. Of course, no video game system will succeed without quality games, but the PSP had those in abundance too. Grand Theft Auto Liberty and Vice City Stories, Persona 3, Final Fantasy Tactics, Monster Hunter, Crisis Core, Peace Walker and Ghost of Sparta were just a few of the big budget games that had no right to be portable. The handheld also had a ton of fantastic less mainstream titles like Luminez, Patapon and Loco Roco, not to mention backwards compatibility with the PS1 thanks to digital downloads, another way in which the handheld was way ahead of the curve. Yes, the single stick movement may have been a bit of a nuisance for some games and the later revisions of it were beyond goofy, but in every way that matters, the PlayStation Portable was just about the pinnacle of handheld devices before the explosion of smartphones. 
Sony reportedly expected it to sell better, but even in 2024, the PlayStation Portable is a pretty easy sell if you want the best of PlayStation while you're on the shitter. Number 6. The Xbox 360 the Xbox 360 was Microsoft going in extremely hard to come out on top in the 7th generation of consoles, arguably too hard. While the 360's earlier release and better price than the PS3 helped it to quite the impressive early lead, it also meant that the console was almost fatally rushed out the door, with the red ring of death going down in video game infamy. However, once the earliest model was revised, the Xbox 360 kept up its lead over the PlayStation 3 until right in the dying days of the generation, and just kept putting out hit after hit. While Halo was smashing records constantly, the 360 also spawned new pillar IPs for the Xbox brand like Gears of War and Crackdown, while franchises like Fable and Forza were solidified as huge names. Third party support was also superb across the entire generation, with the 360 often being the best place to play games on console. Microsoft even continued to basically leap into a brick wall with a slew of RPGs to try and break the Japanese market, but that was just never going to happen. However, above all else, what the 360 will most likely be remembered for is when online gaming was truly brought into the living room with very few asterisks. It had never been easier to place curses on strangers for spawn camping thanks to Xbox Live, with the era probably being multiplayer gaming at its most frenzied, least sweaty best, before the rise of streaming platforms made everyone eat energy drinks and prejudice for breakfast. It was a purer time. The, the, the Kinect? No, we, you don't need to talk about the Kinect. You, you can't make us do that, because that makes it real, and I don't want that to happen. Number 5. The Sega Genesis Sega's most successful ever console, and by a wide margin too, the Genesis was everything a competitor to the SNES could ever need to be. It had the attitude that the SNES's squeaky clean image didn't, its very own mascot of equally murky origin, and a broad selection of games that still hold up remarkably well today. When you say Sega, the first thing most people think of after they reenact that startup sound, of course, is Sonic the Hedgehog, who had his major breakout on the Genesis and was then sent down into the content mines for the next 30 years. But the Genesis also boasted other massively influential names like Streets of Rage, Golden Axe, Shining Force, Beyond Oasis, Shinobi, Gunstar and Fantasy Star that would proudly support the spine of any console for years. Of course, it also helps the Genesis or Mega Drive, if you're feeling not American, that it was the first console with a 16-bit processor and proudly showcased a vivid array of colours that still take the eye today. There's something to the Genesis aesthetic that will feel forever timeless, no matter how eerily realistic modern visual fidelity may become. For instance, Ellie from The Last of Us may end up looking like Gary Oldman in Lost in Space one day, but Streets of Rage will always look very sexy. Then there's the music, which feels akin to playing a radio station that exclusively plays sounds of the 90s arcade, 24-7. For those who lived in that era, they're the sounds of better, simpler times. Sega may have struggled to make much of a dent on the industry after its success, but for starting many of gaming's most hallowed franchises, and for briefly doing what Nintendo didn't, the Genesis will live longer in the memory than a gorilla with a set of drumsticks. Number 4. The PlayStation 4 the PlayStation 4 is the result of Sony's singular vision after a generation in which everyone was obsessed with gimmicks, make good games, and sell them. It's probably the most fuss-free console of all time, a system that did what it did well and was rewarded for it time and time again. While it didn't launch with many essential games, it had a slow start overall. Once the PlayStation 4 got going with quality exclusives, it felt like they never really stopped. Bloodborne, Remaster It Cowards and Uncharted 4 laid down the groundwork for the kind of epic experiences players could expect on Sony's newest big box, with the likes of Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War, Marvel's Spider-Man, Death Stranding, The Last of Us Part 2 and Ghost of Tsushima not far behind. Sony also wasn't averse to taking some creative risks on the fourth PlayStation though, as the likes of Concrete Genie, Dreams and Gravity Rush 2 offered something different away from the cinematic norm. Then there's PlayStation VR, which while an absolute headache of cables to sort out, works surprisingly well despite the youth of the field versus the relative age of the PlayStation 4 itself. The PlayStation 4 is remarkably incident-free on reasons to place it lower when compiling any list of the best video game consoles ever released. 
maybe its midlife upgrade stretched the generation on slightly too long. And then there's the fact that PlayStation Network was no longer free after its debut on PS3, though the rise of free-to-play games made this less of an issue as the 8th generation wore on. And while the lack of any kind of new Ape Escape game should be a crime punishable by the law, at least we saw the rather unexpected return of Medieval, which nobody played. You can't win them all. However, if it's the best visuals and stories on console you're looking for, the PlayStation 4 was the place to be over the last decade for a very good reason. Number 3. The Nintendo Switch Nintendo didn't exactly need saving as such after the disappointment of the Wii U, but the Switch took the company back to a level that they hadn't been at since the early 90s, and all while basically being a generation behind in terms of power too. Nobody does a unique selling point quite like Nintendo, and few systems are as easy a sell as a home console that you can take with you on the go. With the handheld market shrinking due to the rise of mobile gaming, Nintendo looked to quite literally switch things up and completely re-energise their brand with a huge gamble, one that many didn't expect they'd pull off. Being able to explore the open world of Hyrule in vivid 3D and uncomfortably gaze at Mario next to real people from the comfort of your bed was enough to convince people that Nintendo were onto something with the Switch early on. While it certainly took them a minute or two to get cooking on other essential experiences, the system has been boiling ever since. Metroid, Fire Emblem, Smash Bros, Kirby, Xenoblade, Pikmin, Animal Crossing and even Advance Wars found the limelight on Switch, and the hybrid also became the place to play indies like Hades, Stardew Valley, Hollow Knight and Celeste, to name just a few. The Switch's influence can already be felt on handhelds like the Steam Deck, and while the sheen is coming off the experience the more years tick by without any performance revisions, the Switch just keeps on selling and selling. It may just go on to beat a console we'll get to soon as the best selling console of all time, proving once and for all that the cutting edge isn't always the sharpest route to take. Yep, sometimes you just need to milk cows with your mates. Number 2. The SNES if the NES saved the industry from the wild west of the 80s, then the SNES shaped its future, though the platform did basically ruin people with lisps. Millions upon millions of players still view the SNES as the platonic ideal of video games at their purest, most joyful form, and unless you're playing Rise of the Robots, they may just be right. The SNES lived up to its name by basically superpowering everything that players already loved about the NES. The jump from 8-bit to 16-bit was a significant one, allowing the kind of colourful, vivid imagery that Nintendo has made its name on. Nintendo's iconic lineup of characters really started to develop actual character on the SNES, with the games themselves almost all holding up incredibly well today, perhaps even better than those on the N64 in the following generation. The SNES lineup has a right to be considered as the best 16-bit library in history, to the point where you run out of breath listing them all, just like I'm about to do now. Super Mario World, Z. Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2, Super Castlevania 4, Super Mario RPG, Super Metroid, getting tired of saying Super at this point, Chrono Trigger, A Link to the Past, Earthbound, Mega Man X, F-Zero and Secret of Mana can all lay a claim to being the absolute pinnacles of their genre. And the SNES can also claim to have a little bit of everything for people of all tastes. NBA Jam is possibly the highest peak arcade sports games have ever reached. Killer Instinct and Street Fighter 2 represented the fighting genre at its most pixel perfect, and even SimCity's Miracle SNES port made sure simulation fans were covered. With the SNES, the arcade came home, and then some. It's the perfect distillation of the 90s, a bright, boisterous console that always put fun first. It's as important to gaming as penicillin is to medicine, what burgers are to buns, what Peter Molyneux is to the art of lying. But it doesn't have Ape Escape, so the only clear, objective winner has to be number 1. The PlayStation 2 if the original PlayStation made gaming cool, the PlayStation 2 made it put on a pair of sunglasses and dodge bullets in slow motion. The PS2 released at a time when the Millennium Bug had bitten everybody, with pop culture taking on a whole new edge. It was simply a different time to be alive. The PS2, much like the PS4, set its stall out early on and simply asked people to buy in, with its first year on the market being maybe the best debut year any console has ever seen. 
While it was nowhere near the cutting edge of technology by the time the generation concluded, the PlayStation 2 entered the sixth gen with a bang, showcasing the kinds of animations and facial features that were jaw-dropping then and still offer plenty to be charmed by today. The likes of Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, Shadow of the Colossus and Dragon Quest 8 still pack quite the punch, to name just a few of the console's games that have lasted the distance and may still do for a few decades longer. Once you start listing off the best games on the PlayStation 2, you might as well settle in for the long haul. The Jack Trilogy, which proved you can teach a naughty dog new tricks. The transformative Silent Hill 2 and its two less appreciated but still essential sequels. Kratos at his most vain poppingly peeved off in the first two God of War games. Kingdom Hearts at its most logical with the debut and sophomore entries. Final Fantasy X boasting the most sensational CG visuals ever committed to a video game up to that point, also Final Fantasy XII came out of the console as well. Devil May Cry proving to be one of the best missteps ever, Monster Hunter basically setting up an entire genre 10 years before anyone else was ready to copy it. And who could ever discredit the five Grand Theft Auto games released in six years, which is even more remarkable when you consider Rockstar has recently released one in... 10 years. Abandonment issues, who is this freak? Away from the games, it's also worth highlighting just how vital the console's built-in DVD player was to the home video market too, with the format now somehow still being supported over a quarter of a century on. And while it was hardly the smoothest, most user-friendly experience, especially before the broad adoption of broadband, those who took the action online via PS2 network play, with the likes of Resident Evil Outbreak, Final Fantasy XI, which is somehow still going on on PC, and SOCOM must have felt like they belonged to a special club who could see into the future. For the games, the record smashed, and so much more. The best video game console of all time simply has to be the PlayStation 2. And that was our video on the best consoles of all time. Whew, quite the undertaking, but I really, really enjoyed doing that. If you enjoyed watching it, be sure to let us know down in the comments down below. I've been Jimmy Denallen for Cultured Vultures, and thank you for watching.